Now, in, in the last couple of years, we've had many initiatives which wrote off the debt. So if you're going, they're going to build up new debt, it's going to constrain their ability again, a la what Peter said, down the line. Unless they build up the tax base, yeah. But, but it takes many years, yes. and I'll come to that on tax base in a minute. So the point I'm making is that the ability of a, uh, it's possible Tanzania and Uganda can possibly maintain uh, their uh, expansion in towns for, for some time because they have fiscal space to do so. Can Togo do it? I doubt it. Can Republic of Congo do it? I doubt it. So I'm just saying that you have to look at the countries and then ask this question. On the tax base, now we in the fiscal affairs department have been working on building tax bases in, this, in the low income countries for the last 30 years. We have done a hell of a lot of work on setting up the revenue authorities, in setting up the tax system, including the revenue administration, including the tax policy, such that more revenues are mobilized. Um, and of course, um, these things, some countries have made more progress. Tanzania is one such country. There are others which have not moved, despite, and there could be many reasons. Not necessarily the one which you are talking about, but if you inflate some other, uh, the tax base will improve. I mean, we know for Latin American That's experience. That's not really what I'm saying. So, I'm saying. So, so basically, uh, the, 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 uh, the idea is that it takes time to build tax systems, and a lot of work is going on. Some countries have progress. Tanzania, as I said, is a case in point. But there are others which are, despite all the efforts of many development partners, there hasn't been much success. And one needs to look into those countries why that is the case. And so, so the point I'm making is that um, um, I agree. And if you look at the number of papers that we have published, we are talking about expanding the revenue base. We see this as a critical way to sustain the development programs in the country, to ensure that the countries will have resources when the aid tapers off. Uh, of course, when you start talking about aid taking off, there are a group of people like you who say aid should not taper off. We should not even be discussing this. Uh, so what we are saying is that even if it doesn't taper off, it will supplement aid resources. But you need domestic resources to be able to uh, do a lot of things. Finally, you talked about this paper on inflation that came out. Uh, uh, the the uh, the one which our chief economist wrote. Uh, the new paper on on the now that paper um, he wrote that in the personal capacity. It's not the the paper which has been endorsed by management or been endorsed by the board, um, and it's to stimulate debate. Uh, and essentially, the idea is that uh, this higher inflation number, from 2 to 4 percent for US and for Eurozone countries, would have allowed um, more, you know, more flexibility with regard to monetary policy, thereby reduce, reducing their reliance on fiscal policy. Because the fiscal deficits now, and we, we talked about it here, have increased tremendously. Uh, in the industrial countries, the debt to GDP ratios by 2014 would be 110% of GDP of fiscal in Canada for the advanced uh, G20 countries. And that's near sort of doubling of uh, the ratios. And that is very worrying to uh, a lot of people. And he said that perhaps for the next crisis, one way to deal with it is to have a slightly higher inflation target because that will reduce the reliance on fiscal policy. Thank you, Sanjeev. It's kind of hard to figure out if we're responding to questions or again to each other. Uh, uh, it, it seems the latter. Um, so I, I'm, let me just raise a couple um, quick points. One, one questioner, I think, uh, who's left, unfortunately, did raise questions about, you know, is, is age really tied to neoliberalism? What happened? Why are 
some of the actually higher income Southern African countries, why do they have the highest rates? Why is it that when AIDS first hits a country, it tends to hit the higher income bracket more strongly and then later uh, reaches lower income brackets? And I think these are complicated questions. I think it has a lot to do with, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, the mining industry. I we took a map of the AIDS pandemic in the 1990s and put it over the the places where mines were and where mine workers came from, where migrant, you know, mine workers came from. It would be a, a near perfect correlation. It's clear that reliance on single sex male uh, migratory labor is highly correlated with uh, sexually transmitted diseases in the, in the AIDS pandemic itself. Um, people with more money have more money with which to buy sex, uh, are sometimes more desirable than sex partners. Uh, there's, there's lots of explanations about why that might be true. But of course, the, the larger issues of structural violence and income inequality and the gradients of, of those inequalities and those impacts on, on women's vulnerability and on vulnerability of, of uh, marginalized populations is, is pretty clear as well. So uh, again, Rick goes into that a little bit, others have gone into it much more, but people want to look at you know, what's a more complicated version of why this has happened the way it's happened, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I couldn't agree more that there are countries have other health priorities and just because I'm an AIDS activist doesn't mean that we don't think that those other health priorities are high concern. If you look at the history of activism on a global scale for increasing human resources for health and trying to help uh, strengthen health systems, at least from the activist community, it's significantly been led for AIDS activists. We were talking about human resources for health in 2003 at the World Health Assembly um, and have consistently fought for Global Fund and PEPFAR to have components for health system strengthening and human resources for health. And not just for HIV, because no one no one is a patient of only one disease. No one's family only has one health problem. Uh, the issues of, of countries not having uh, rehydration salts, you know, uh, and, and, and kids dying, you know, babies dying for, for lack of a, a penny and a half uh, intervention is, is truly horrific. But these are systemic issues that are the result of long-lasting problems, some of which arise in the developing countries themselves, some of which arise from the neoliberal economic uh, model, uh, some of which arise from developing country uh, leaders and elites neglect of their rural populations in particular and poor people more generally. There's plenty of blame to, sh uh, to share, but to some extent the question is, are people like ourselves who are in more privileged countries that have such huge resources, um, do we have a role to play for ongoing long-term global solidarity to improve the health writ large for people in poor countries? And I hope people here think the answer is yes. If you've got a government that's only spending $10 per person per year, which is true in many developing countries, can we manage to find some additional resources in this country to raise that to what is, you know, $50 per person per year, which will address many of the most pressing health needs and have some money left for um, broader health system strengthening and to expand human resources for health? I can't see how the answer is no. Um, and can we, because of the way the world is kind of put together and the IMF is responsible for a small piece of macroeconomic policy and then who knows who's controlling the financial industry? I'd like to find out because I'd like to know where to go lobby. Uh, you know, what, what is the World Bank doing on development? You know, all this stuff is parceled up in a particular way, but if you look at the overall imprint of the system we put together and its horrific impact on developing countries, 